and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. Let's begin with the kerfuffle around Pongal festivities in schools. So today there was a circular issued by the Education Ministry which was referred uh, which referred to a declaration by the Sharia panel at Jakim, which is the Department of Islamic Development Malaysia. Now, uh, the declaration stated that since Pongal is a religious celebration of the Hindu community, it is therefore haram for Muslims to join in Pongal festivities, quote, especially the event where milk rice is cooked, unquote. Now, the news has since gone viral on social media with many Malaysian Hindus pointing out that Pongal is not a celebration for Hindu worshippers. Instead, it is a celebration for a bountiful harvest and, and prosperity to come. So Pongal, according to them, has nothing to do with religion. And now we've also heard their responses from the various ministries and from Jakim. So Sherrod, what have they said? Well, let's look at each of them in turn. We have the Ministry of Education, which has said essentially they put out the circular to allay the concerns, uh, possible concerns, or potential concerns of Muslim parents about how to approach this particular festival if it's held in a school. Also, we had uh, Mujahid, uh, Mujahid Rawa, of course, he's the Minister of, of Religion, who's come out to say uh, that the problem essentially, because this, this was an attempt to uh, prevent a controversy, that this has been a failure of communications. Now, going back to Jakim, very interesting because Jakim has said that it's not essentially responsible. This is a Ministry of Education uh, issue, but they provided the the kind of theological right. underpinnings for the circular in the sense that they made the argumentation, or rather the argument, that this is a religious, not a cultural festival and pointed to particular elements that they were concerned about. Mm. Yeah. I was more interested in the Education Ministry's response and acknowledging that there was such a circular, but uh, insisted that it's not prohibited schools from celebrating the Pongal festival. Now, what's also interesting about this is, as you mentioned, Shira, this was, the circular was kind of preemptive in a way. So they want, according to the education ministry, they wanted to allay concerns of Muslim parents concerned about their children uh, participating in such festivities. Now, this was even before anything happened. And I'm just wondering whether in their, their attempt to preempt the backlash, they then in fact caused the controversy. Yeah, that may be true. I mean, I, I think it's good that, that uh, you know, government officials are concerned about the optics of anything that happens and want to, to do the right thing, uh, allaying concerns, uh, directing people, guiding them as to how to deal with what many of us grew up in, in, you know, in, in different times where these weren't really big issues and right. we were, act, in fact, many often uh, taught by our parents or people in our community about how to deal with others with different cultures or different religious uh, uh, practices. I mean, now it's become almost the government's responsibility. I think, which is a uh, which is an issue of concern. Why has it become the government's right. responsibility to deal with these particular and, issues? And I think also lately there's been this, uh, you know, distinction that needs to be made. Everyone has to kind of draw clear lines as to what is cultural practice, what is religious practice, and I feel that. Um, we use the cultural to kind of avoid stepping on other religious toes, when in fact, sometimes the lines are very, very blurred. Yeah, they are. And you know, Melissa, uh, one very easy way that people use, or kind of common sense way of making a distinction between what is religious and what is cultural is to look at the way different communities within, uh, say, a subset. Like, so I come from the, the Malayali uh, community, right? So it's an ethno-linguistic group, very small in Malaysia. Now, they have a harvest festival called Onam, and it's celebrated by every Everybody within that community who speaks that language, uh, regardless of religious affiliation. Mm. But we all know that uh, cultural practice and religious practice, or religious practices could be deeply cultural, and cultural practices might uh, t uh, take a borrow from religious uh, iconography mm. or symbolism and icon sorry, iconography, and therefore, you know. It is, those lines are in fact blurred. Yeah. All right. Well, in other news relating to the education ministry, it is now surveying schools to find out how many students are wearing black shoes and socks. Now, this is all part of an assessment of the policy a year after it was introduced back in 2019. So, all primary and secondary schools have been given until January 22nd to find out the number of students who wear white or black shoes. So the Education Ministry has had to come out to clarify rumours on social media 
about the government possibly considering switching back to white shoes. Now, this is not the case. I want to underscore that. This is not the case. In fact, the misunderstanding arose after the Friends of Masli Malik Facebook shared an education ministry circular that claimed there would be a quote-unquote, review of the black shoe policy in schools. Well, Melissa, you know, policies ought to be reviewed. Uh, yes. their, their effectiveness uh, tested against the realities of uh, the actual implementation and so on and so forth. That's always a good thing. Mm. But why we have come to spend so much time <laughs> on black shoes and you know, what we've learned recently is a, is a rather peripheral uh, initiative by uh, Masli Malik when he was education minister is, I think, something that is a deep concern. Now, is the media driving this? Is the, is the media, in fact, and I'm talking about the social media, I'm talking about the mainstream media, in fact, driving the agenda and preventing us from looking at real serious issues within the Ministry of Education in terms of policy uh, rather than these hot button clickbait type of stories? Well, okay, I, I, I can see where this is, where you're coming from, Sherrod, because there's been a lot of man hours spent on discussing black shoes and socks, yes? But this is symptomatic of the trust deficit when it comes to U-turns in policy. So I think when people read this and the media feels the need to report this, wondering whether a year after such a policy has been announced, will the government then U-turn um, in, in, you know, in its implementation? And this is, of course, coming after um, Dr. Masli Male has uh, resigned from office and Dr. Mahathir is now acting uh, Education Minister. The key question is, will there be uh, a review of Masli's policies will, or there, will there be continuity in what we're seeing right now? Yeah, but don't think that uh, the, the Black Shoe uh, initiative uh, during his term as uh, minister was actually the thing that we should focus exactly, on. Exactly. Never no. mind. Good point. <laughs> That's what the... Uh, I mean, it's not wrong for the media to, in fact, uh, point this out. Just All right. The, just the inordinate amount of time that we spend on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Prime Minister's communication advisor, Kadir Jassin, has called on the government to reconsider its accommodating stance towards Indian expatriates and workers, as well as products from India. Now, this follows unconfirmed reports that India was imposing restrictions on Malaysian refined palm oil. Is this all going to lead to an escalation of tensions with India, Sharad? Well, there are already tense relations between the two countries. The question is whether Kadir Justice wants to see more tension rather than less. And mm. this initiative clearly is an attempt to escalate uh, the tensions between the two countries. The question is why? And at whose behest is Kadir Justice doing this or making these suggestions? Now, if you read the, the article, uh, the report, uh, Ben Kadir Jassin says that for hundreds of years, and, and, and you know, the, that we, and he uses we, uh, been accommodating uh, people from India. It's a curious one because as, I, as far as I know, the Pakistan government is only uh, not even two years old. Uh, Barisan National post-independence government, so not 60 years old. So not quite sure what he means by these hundreds of years of accommodation, if they include the colonial period. Right. So, mm. Okay. Well, what, what then about those restrictions, um, Apparently, those, those you know, unconfirmed reports about the restrictions to uh, refined power. Yeah, so part of the, the problem seems to be there's some jumpiness about uh, relations between the two countries. Mm. So when uh, in India announced that it wasn't going to be exporting onions, it was taken as, uh, as a retaliation against Malaysia. What we do know is that India has laws regarding um, the supply of onions. If they're not enough in India, they just don't export anymore. Right. Uh, so that wasn't, in fact, uh, confirmed. Uh, Theresa Koch is a, a minister of uh, prime minister industries has come out to say that there is no ban. What India has done is it, it's placed uh, refined palm oil under the restricted category, but it doesn't, in fact, specifically mention Malaysia. Right. So uh, the question is, why does Kazir Jassin want to push the government towards retaliation and against 150,000 or so people from uh, the subcontinent who are working here? Does he mean barbers? Does he mean uh, IT workers, many of whom uh, run, run the multi -super, multimedia super corridor? Right. I mean, it's, I'm actually quite astounded that this has come out um, from somebody so close to the government well, of, of the day. It's a question of our diplomatic relations with India, definitely. I mean, do we want to pick a fight with an economy that big, especially since we are so export reliant? Uh, it's in our best interest, of course, to be, keep friendly ties with all our trading uh, partners. Okay, after this, we're going we're gonna to take a quick break. And after this, we're going to take a look at that controversial Sabah temporary pass that's coming up next on Consider This. Stay tuned.
Thank you for staying with Consider This. Melissa and Sharad here with you tonight. A group of Sabahans today gathered in Mambakut town in objection to the controversial Sabah Temporary Pass or PSS, Pass Sementara Sabah, which is set to be rolled out on June 1st. Now, this protest comes three days before the Kimanis by-election this Saturday. So to provide us more insight into the PSS and why it's so important the Kimanis by election. We have joining us on the line Dr. Zaini Uthman, political analyst at University of Malaysia Sabah. Zaini, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, can you begin by explaining to us the PSS? Uh, thank you for uh, giving me a call. Well, I think uh, what we need to understand by past Mantara Sabah is we must understand from, the, from uh, a big picture. Uh, because uh, you know this illegal immigrant issue is uh, what is a long-standing issue in Sabah. Uh, so the so-called past SS is part and partial of the social uh, move by the government. Uh, the, the word is government; it's not a political party. It's not the government in order to uh, make a very constructive management towards this illegal immigrant. So that that the way we should understand this this SS issue. So I think personally, uh, there is uh, some misconceptions or misunderstanding what is this SS all about. Uh, we, we must understand this, this SS uh, from the, uh, the concept of uh, security, uh, from the concept of uh, a national is issue across a political party. So you shouldn't be, you know, trapped under uh, uh, the concept of uh, party rivalries between the political party in Malaysia. Nevertheless, Zaini, it seems that uh, political parties are making uh, uh, political capital from this, at least those in opposition to Warisan, Warisan being the party that's backing this. Uh, why do you think that's come? I mean, the one, is, one thing that's often said is that uh, the PSS is a gateway to citizenship. Is that true? No, that, 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 that's not true. That's, that's where I, what I mentioned just now, that to understand this issue is really a test for the for the level of political literacy among the citizens itself, especially the you know the Sabahan. Uh, so we, we need to understand this issue from a very a broader concept. Of course, political parties they, they will use whatever issue or or any any kind of opportunity for them, you know, especially during the by election or during the general election for them to to vote for the political support. But for the citizens. Uh, I think we must understand this uh, from a, from a literacy point of view. Uh, so this is where the, I think for for any government, whatever policy that they want to implement, especially the policy that really concerns the the state of the security of the of the country or uh, the interest of the people. So I think they they need to engage more uh, with the with the public. They need to. For example, they need to, to, to help some uh, uh, town hall with the, with the, uh, with the concerned parties to, to, to explain you know, to the public that this matter is beyond political parties. This matter is actually about you know, the, the national interest. It's not about the political interest. Zani, it's said that uh, the PSS issue is now dominating the Kimanis uh, by-election. Is this because um, uh, Kimanis as a constituency, as an area, has a, a big uh, problem with undocumented uh, migrants? Or is it just that people are picking up on a, na on a statewide issue? Well, I think... Uh, I think the, the most, uh, uh, I mean, the, the most appropriate to explain that is because the, of the, of the, you know, Kimanis is situated in the west coast of Sabah. And normally the, west, uh, the people of the west coast of Sabah, they, they, they have more, I mean, uh, more concern, their, 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 their sentiments uh, towards Sabah, for Sabah is, is much higher as compared to the east coast of, of Sabah. So I think that's, that's why this, this matter being brought up during this, uh, you know, two weeks of the political campaign within uh, the party involved. So, Zaini, you talked a little bit just now about the misconceptions around this, that this, is, this, is, this has become a politicised issue uh, when it is, in fact, uh, in national, for the national interest. Now, I'm just wondering about the communication around this initiative. How has that been managed if such misconceptions has, um, has, been spread, has spread like wildfire? 
Well, well, the, the policy, this peace access policy, is it just come into the table. You know, it's a, it's a matter of, uh, I mean, to, to proceed uh, before before they can proceed is it, still new. It's, it's a matter that that I think uh, the public must uh, give a chance to the, to the new government uh, to really implement. And then during the, the election campaign, the, 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 the government, the Wallachian government, did explain, you know, to the public that what, what exactly this is SS. So this is SS is actually uh, the, the issue or the, 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 uh, the method that the present government are using based on the suggestion made by the uh, Commission for, for this Illegal Immigrant uh, Situation in Sabah. So that, that's why I think um, the misconceptions and the misunderstanding uh, pertaining to this issue come come into landmark. Uzani, is uh, Warisan likely to lose this election because of the PSS issue? Well, I think I think for for in any election, uh, there are a lot of issues, not just only one single issue. But definitely, this PSS issue will have uh, certain impacts, you know, to, to to the level of support for, for the Warisan. Okay. And beyond the uh, PSS, what are the issues, what are the local issues um, are, are coming into play in the Kimanis by-elections? Is it about local issues or is it really about the candidates, the personalities? Uh, that, that's come in, in package, though. Know. Uh, it, it is uh, about uh, you know, local and non-local issues, about the candidates uh, that, that come together with the development issue as well. So the development issue is also one of the you know big talking points uh, during this two weeks uh, campaign now zani there's also the and and i'm very interested about the campaign is Sabah politics changing as a consequence of the last general elections or the takeover uh, of warisan with you know all this rhetoric about malaysia baru you know are we seeing less money politics are we seeing less violations of election rules and uh, perhaps issue-based uh, concerns coming to the fore what, what's the feel like in sabah oh, well it, it depends the uh, area by area so now Kimani is a, is a very much a semi rural area. You know, the, the people uh, are segregated between the, 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 the agrarian and then the semi professional. So, I mean, the, it's really a test. As I said just now, it's really a test of the political literacy, not just only in Sabah, not, not just only in Kimani, it's for, for the whole Malaysia, actually. Definitely, and we'll keep a close eye on the campaign ahead of the by-election this Saturday. Zaini, thank you so much for speaking with us and sharing your insights there from Sabah. We'll be back with more on Consider This. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Consider This. Melissa and Sharad here with you tonight. And here's what we want you to consider this evening. Former Rokanova reality show participant Zarith Sofia Mohamed Yassin was fined 27,000 ringgit for keeping and confining a sun bear cub in her condominium last year. Now, Zarith Sofia claimed that she thought the sun bear cub was a dog. So, my question is, I wonder what the appeal is of having an exotic animal as a pet. I really don't get it, Sherrod. Bragging rights, clearly. But, you know, but let's, let's get to, back to the uh, <laughs> excuse that she gave. And I don't know if this was an under pressure, you know, there she is in the dock. And maybe in mitigation, she says that, that this could have been a dog. She doesn't know. Uh, she clearly hasn't been exposed to uh, many uh, uh, you know, television shows or movies where dogs appear. Um, I do. I do or real I, life. Nice, right. But it, it, it is very, um, in some ways, Melissa, uh, very uh, concerning because these yeah. animals are protected for a reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to ignore that just for the, the bragging rights of having an exotic animal that you could Instagram and so on and so forth. Yeah. Is is really irresponsible. Okay. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we laugh. We may we may make, make light, but this is really an important issue. And I 
I, I think about what social media has done, right? Because it seemed to, you know, um, be a kind of a status symbol to have an exotic pet because it's the novelty of having um, this this type of, uh, you know, a protected animal as a pet, having owning one, um, that seemed to be fashionable. And the more these types of influencers or celebrities post such photos on social media, and they do look cute, you know, because they, they, they're young, they're cubs, they're baby uh, animals. Uh, it, it, I think it condones it or it normalizes having this and people, or fo their followers who, who see it, think that it's okay and may also want to have one as yeah. well. And, you know, of course, you know, I'm not quite sure she's thought it through about, uh, you know, what, what happens when the sun bear grows up. Because it's a tiny uh, creature, I mean a tiny-ish creature right. in comparison to other types of bears. Uh, but it's not exactly uh, an animal, I think, that can be domesticated. And it's got long claws, right. as I remember correctly. Well, so what was she thinking? What was she going to do when it became an adult? It's the same issue that happened with the family that adopted an ostrich which is probably a very cute little animal to have but then they grew up to be a seven footer uh, and I think might not have been appreciated by the neighbors so much. I once yeah. did an interview with the Gibbon Protection Society of Malaysia um, talking which rehabilitates uh, rescued gibbons that have been part of the illegal trade or kept as pets and I saw firsthand the complicated process of rehabilitating a traumatized animal at the hands at, in human hands yeah. in it fact, takes you years. need to ask mm. you know what happened why was this cub even available for her to purchase was it stolen from its mother was it taken from the wild was it already part of some other animal in captivity and and these are questions i hope that uh, Pahilatan or the relevant uh, uh, authorities investigate because we want to know I think we should know, find out where this cub, baby cub, a uh, sun bear came yeah. from. Do you know, uh, for gibbons, for every gibbon that, that makes it in the hands of uh, a human household for a domestic pet, 20 other gibbons were killed in the process. So the mother, the fam, the people, the other tribe members that were actually defending this, this one cub, the cubs that died along the way in transportation. So I think when people look at an, a picture on Instagram of you know, an exotic pet such as a sun bear cub or a, a gibbon, they don't realise the impact it has on the entire chain and the, the trauma that 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 baby cub, that baby animal has gone through. Well, Melissa, that's very, very sad statistics yeah. there. Uh, we wanted this as, as a lighter segment, but clearly it's turned into well, it's something, something... Something to consider, yeah, definitely, absolutely. tonight. All right, that's all the time we have for the show. We will be back with you same time tomorrow with another episode of Consider This. Thank you so much for watching and good night.